Last episode, we told the story of a short-lived political movement that wanted to install a Soviet of engineers. The technological complex of the United States is revolutionary and radical to the extreme, while the social United States, the social system, is reactionary, obsolete, and antiquated. Their movement was called Technocracy Incorporated. And their slogan was, government by science, social control through the power of technique. If you haven't already heard that episode, go back to your feed and find it. Okay, on to technocracy now, part two. From Cited Media, this is Darts and Letters. I'm Gordon Cabot. We started our series with a particular vision of technocracy that came from Thorsten Veblen. Veblen put the industrial engineer at the heart of his theory, which made a certain amount of sense, because this was the industrial age. Steel, telephone, automobile, electricity, even aviation, they're all 19th century industries. They were all done by what I would call talented tinkerers, by men who worked quite independently. You're hearing the sociologist Daniel Bell. In 1973, he wrote a famous book that was partly answering Veblen. It was called The Coming of the Post-Industrial Society. Bell said that things superseded Veblen and his industrial tinkerers. So that here you get a radical change in the source of innovation in society. And I called it at that time a post-industrial society because it was in relationship to the industrial society. Today, more people call it the information age. Or knowledge society. Bell thought that this would mean a new technocratic class. But the core of this new class wouldn't be in the factory with the practical knowledge of the tinkerers. It would be in the university with the theoretical knowledge of intellectuals. And here I would say, and this is the second dimension of my argument, that a post-industrial society is the codification of theoretical knowledge. Bell claimed these post-industrial technocrats were developing Impressive new intellectual technologies. Technologies for producing and interpreting information, for predicting, calculating, modeling, and even controlling society. Bell wrote, The goal of these new intellectual technologies is, neither more nor less, to realize a social alchemist's dream. The dream of ordering the mass society. One of the most exciting intellectual technologies of the time was called cybernetics. Cybernetics. The name comes from the Greek word for steersman. Cybernetics, though, may not be at all simple to understand at first glance. This is Norbert Wiener. Actually, it's an actor playing Norbert Wiener in a very strange IBM-sponsored intellectual chat show. There's a host who's conducting a kind of interview with Norbert Wiener. I noticed that you call it cybernetics. I've always called it cybernetics. Well, I have been known to do things differently. Wiener came up with his radical idea when working on the U.S. war effort in World War II. He was thinking about how to aim an anti-aircraft gun at an enemy plane. Of course, you have to shoot ahead of the plane. But how far ahead? It was really a very simple problem to solve. Every hunter who has ever taken aim at a flying bird instinctively knows the trick. It's just a question of making use of certain available data concerning the aircraft itself and the gun's own properties. When you have this data, it's possible to determine the exact place at which you have to aim in order to hit the plane, which is, of course, still moving. Cybernetics is a theory of mathematical relationships in a circular system. Okay, so you put something into the system, it reacts to your input with its own output, and then you react again. In the system, then, causation isn't straightforward, it's circular. And the basis of that is feedback. Okay, so I know this is all a little abstract, but what do I mean by circular causation and feedback? Well, 
In this example, when you shoot at the plane and miss, the system is giving you feedback, like how far off from the plane were you? And this changes your actions, but it also changes the actions of the pilot. Now, when you come to understand how this feedback system operates, you can understand the system as a whole. It's like mastering a video game. So my aim improved as I became better able to use the feedback I was getting from the screen. Wiener went on to theorize how feedback circulated in much, much, much more complex systems, like the economy. Supply, demand, price signals, these were systems of feedback. If you understand those systems in cybernetic terms, you could predict things. Then you could act to preserve the system or disrupt it. What are the limits of the application of cybernetics to economics or human affairs? The same difficulty applies to all mathematics. If you could define the relationships exactly before you set out and then translate them into mathematical symbols, the mathematics would work perfectly. But it is in choosing those relationships and defining them that we have the problem. Nevertheless, we are going to have to understand ever more complex systems if we are to deal with the future. Without that understanding, there may be no future. It was a theory of mathematical certainty in an uncertain world, a world where nuclear annihilation could come at any moment. Cybernetics became the obsession of many scholars in a wide range of disciplines, and it emboldened a new kind of technocrat, a technocrat who said you could transcend petty political ideologies so long as you collected the right data and understood how to interpret it. How can we evaluate the contribution made by Wiener to our thinking today? Well, it would be difficult to overestimate that contribution. The thinking started by Wiener with his concern for feedback systems is likely to have a much greater impact on society than the word games of traditional philosophy. We begin part two of our series, Technocracy Now. First, the liberal technocrats who used cybernetics for stability. They preferred the US-led global order. Later in the episode, could cybernetics be used to disrupt that very same order? We look at the cyber socialism of Allende's Chile. I'm Gordon Caddick, and you're listening to Darts and Letters. Darts and Letters is a proud member of the Harbinger Media Network. That's Canada's largest left-wing podcast network. Harbinger is broadcasting from the world to come. It's a more environmentally, socially, and economically just world. And you can help bring that into being by supporting independent media. Go to harbingermedianetwork.com and find out more about what they do. Okay, back to the program. When you think technocrats, there's a good chance the first place your brain goes to is Cold War liberalism. People like Herman Kahn or Robert McNamara. You've probably heard those names before. You might not have heard of Charles A. McClelland. In the 60s, McClelland was this technocratic political scientist, and he had an audacious idea. He thought you could build a computer system that would predict war. Basically, it worked like this. It sucked up a bunch of news stories, it crunched some numbers, and it spat out reports. Those reports were supposed to tell policymakers when tension was on the rise and when it might turn to crisis. It was a prediction. McClellan thought he could help leaders avert war. Okay, Sunset Boulevard-style spoiler right at the beginning. It didn't really work, or it didn't really go very far, at least, to the best of our knowledge. Maybe that's why you've never heard of Charles A. McClellan. But his techno-utopian dream is being resurrected today by Lockheed Martin. They use McClellan's ideas, but in a much bigger way. At Lockheed Martin, we understand what's at stake. That's why we've spent decades building and connecting the platforms you need to dominate every domain across air, land, sea, cyber, 
and space. We've created technologies that unite disparate and complex systems so you can sense, make sense, and act, protecting in the same moment you detect. To understand what Lockheed Martin is trying to do, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to McClellan's project. It was called the Crisis Early Warning and Monitoring System, or EWAMS. I call it EWAMS. I don't know if that's what they called it, because the designers are no longer with us. This is Joy Rohde. You may remember her from our 59th episode. She is a professor of public policy and of history at the University of Michigan. Rohde studies the militarization of social science expertise. She's basically an expert about experts, especially of the Cold War liberal variety. She tells us that McClelland had a proposal to the U.S. government. Let me build you a cybernetic device. Then you can steer global politics to equilibrium. In terms of thinking about technocracy, I think we want to flag that association between steering and governing. And the idea really is that you can understand any kind of system through this idiom of cybernetics. But where cybernetics really gets picked up powerfully is in areas of information theory. So, you know, early kind of computing and communication. The study of communications itself between humans is also structured as a cybernetic question. And government systems for command and control, like controlling um, giant defense systems to try to monitor for incoming threats. What is the state of the field? And I mean, international relations theory. Why is it such that cybernetics makes it sort of entrance into the field? Yeah. So the state of mainstream IR in the late 1940s and early 1950s is often narrated by scholars as this kind of battle between two different approaches, one being realism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the notion that international affairs is this realm of anarchy and chaos and lawlessness. And the purpose of states is really to try to achieve their ends within a system where you can't really trust any other nations. On the other hand, there's an approach that's termed idealism. That is a notion that international affairs can be understood through laws, through norms, through values. And that idealism is really on the wane. Mm. And so by the time that cybernetics appears, realism is one of the most dominant features of IR. But you also have a set of folks who are concerned that realism, that realism is too focused on, on tension, on conflict. And so cybernetics and more broadly systems theory comes in into IR with a set of folks who call themselves peace scholars. They work on peace studies. And Charles McClelland is one of the original visionaries of this kind of peace studies. And the idea is capturing the international system as a system through these cybernetic approaches allows them to incorporate a broader set of values including peace, but at the same time, as advisors to government, not rely on those values too much, Mm -hmm. right? So that they're not conveying a set of potentially biased, non-objective, non-scientific values. I think some people have heard the term sort of physics envy being lodged at social scientists. He has what you call a meteorological envy. So in what way is the system like a, like a weather system or like the weather system for the planet? Yeah. So his vision is building a global political radar that is like a meteorological set of meteorological stations. And he's not the first to have this mm-hmm. idea. There are a number of folks in IR who have this idea. But for him... International relations can't be a science, like with the kind of certainty that you can have in physics. And the reason is that the system is too stochastic, right? There are too many unexpected things happening because humans just make things messy. So we can understand it like a meteorological system. So what do you do in meteorology? Well, you collect all kinds of data, right? And from that data, you find regularities in interactions between say, you know, temperatures and precipitation. So what McClellan does is he's a professor at the University of Southern California, and he gets money from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which we know as DARPA. And what he does is he says, okay, like meteorologists try to track everything they can. We can't track everything in the international system. There's too much going on. But if we think about 
diplomatic exchanges, missiles fired, treaties, trade relationships, as communication in a cybernetic system, we can understand each nation as an information processor in a broader system. And so all of those messages, all of those threats, all of those offers of support are simply information communications going out into the system. And other nations' responses show you both of those nations like working together or against each other to try to achieve equilibrium. <laughs> And equilibrium is an uh, American-dominated international system, right? I mean, is that how he sees it? I mean, he would never have said that. <laughs> Absolutely not, right? <laughs> Which is um, maybe one of the most characteristic pieces of American foreign relations, right? Those things that, that we don't say are the things that, that matter the most. So, I mean, absolutely. If you look at the data on which he built the system, mm -hmm. the way he traced those communications was through the New York Times, an American newspaper, right, tracking events that are of importance to Americans. In the fact that he never saw that source as needing an explanation, right, but assumed that it was a comprehensive enough representation of a global system, it's fundamentally shot through with American values, the American quest, you know, for hegemony. So they really took literally the all the news that's fit to print. Like, did they really think that the New York Times is an index of all world affairs? They recognized it was limited, but because they're not seeking causal knowledge, right? They're not after scientific claims. They're mm. after a system that works well enough to manage security. Of course, they would love to have it all. But if you think about the constraints of machine memory at the time, the constraints of the human labor of doing this coding, it's a 12-hour job a day mm. to code the New York Times. A human has to do that. So what are you, you're, you're correlating, like you're looking at some meeting of political leaders and looking for indications of tension? Or are you looking at the sort of tone of what people are saying? Like, what are, what are you trying to decode? So McClellan's idea was that you weren't having to even decode too much. Like, you don't have to read into it. All you're actually coding is a few things. First, who are the two nations that are involved? So notice this is also a vision of the international system is fundamentally bipolar, right? There's all these collections of bipolar relationships, but multipolarity, it exceeds your statistical capability <laughs> right now. So you can't think about it. So what are the two nations who are involved? And what is the message? Whatever happens, you want to convert into a message. And there's around 60 different categories that you just pick from the list. You know, was this a threat? Was this an offer of economic aid? Was this a request for military aid? And you just code that. That's all you have to do. And you code the date. Mm. That is what then gets counted and measured. And that so the notion coming back to cybernetics, right? What does this all have to do with cybernetics? The idea that McClelland had was that there are kind of statistical regularities in relationships in communicative relationships between nations, right? So the United States and the Soviet Union are always exchanging various threats, subtle or otherwise, but they're always sort of exchanging the same kinds of communications. Right. We're not randomly reaching out on Monday for an arms control agreement and on Tuesday threatening nuclear warfare. So the way that you pick up tension and communication is when the communications between nations moves out of that regular that you've statistically determined and into the irregular, into the abnormal. So starting to exchange more kinds of those 60 types of information is a sign of instability, right? It's a sign of a nation desperately sending out information in hopes of orienting itself better in this system that suddenly seems like it's out of equilibrium. So that's where the, the regularities and the irregularities that you're trying to, to measure come from. You know, you said there's like a hot spot, there's a tension algorithm, so we're at a seven or an eight or what or four. I mean, how do they decide um where they're at exactly? Are they comparing is this like they're looking at historical data to surmise what are sort of tension tipping points or how would they have identified what makes for enough tension to create a crisis? 
Yeah. So that is a statistical relationship. So once you've built the database out, say over a series of a few years, you can establish the sort of statistical normal of interactions between nations. Right. And the way that they tried to show that their system reliably indicated tensions was by doing retroactive forecasts. So looking back, say, in 1970 and asking, would our system have picked up the Soviet invasion of the Czech Republic in 1968? Oh, yes. Yes, it would have said, you know, tension elevated to an 8 out of 10. Mm -hmm. So it's accurate. And so it's that process of retrospective forecasting, which is still today how a lot of these systems that use time series data to predict things, that's how they validate them. Now, one question you might want to ask yourself is, okay, so the computer system could pick up that, that event, right, in 1968. Well, could someone in the State Department who's on the Eastern European desk Would they have noticed that this was coming? You know, the system, sure, it's picking these things up, but perhaps humans were as well. Perhaps the New York Times journalists themselves were cluing into a hotspot, essentially. They might have been onto something. It's funny because I was actually part of a research team that was coding tweets uh, a couple years ago or a year ago. And I remember how difficult it was. We were trying to surmise, okay, what's the intention of this you know, it was, it was sort of like right-wing media people, and we were trying to figure out what exactly were they talking about, what emotion were they using, who was their target, what did it mean? And I was so sure of certain things that I would code, and then other people would look, and they'd completely disagree with me. And I thought they were so wrong. They thought I was so wrong. And I, I quickly realized both the value-ladenness of any coding, no matter how objective uh, or simple you you think your categories are, but also the imperfect information where even if you did have objective categories, you actually don't have all the necessary information you need to make an accurate judgment. So how did they deal with that, with those problems, I guess? Did they recognize the value-ladenness of coding and did they recognize the imperfect information that the New York Times was giving them? So I'll start with imperfect information. I mean, their idea, this is also a time period when um, there's a lot of psychological research that starts to reveal the purported limitations of human cognition in general, right? Mm -hmm. So as a coder, you're cognitively limited. You're not, you're never going to get perfection. You can't, you're human. And information gaps are just part of that, right? And so they're not expecting totality. They're expecting just enough. But as far as recognizing the value-ladenness of the exercise, McClellan was kind of recalcitrant about it. I mean, he never did, you guys, as you were having your disagreements about your how you coded tweets, right? You're checking inner coder reliability. Mm-hmm. As far as I can tell from the records, he didn't do that. He checked everything himself, like he was the arbiter of the data set. But when he was in charge, there was no intercoder reliability. I don't think he ever would have said that the New York Times was a perfect window or a value-free lens onto what was going on in the world. But I think it did, you know, this is a moment where people still believed in the neutrality of journalism and the potential for journalistic objectivity, which, of course, we don't have right now. Mm -hmm. But for him, the fact that the Times was this arbiter of what happened meant that it should be fairly straightforward. So I know we're getting a little bit into the weeds here, but in just a general sense, I mean, how would you um, judge the kind of accuracy and robustness of this system? (laughs) (laughs) How would I judge it? It's interesting because a lot of times when I talk about this project with like contemporary social scientists who are interested in national security, that's their question. Like, well, did it really work? Yes. And I don't know how to answer that question systematically. I don't know. Did humans notice it? I mean, does looking back and saying, oh, we could have picked it up. Does that mean it works? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that means. And furthermore, even if it did, you know, pick up things that we couldn't notice, does that matter when it is not at all related to any kind of 
claim or insight into what one should do with that information. And I don't even just mean like, should we put boots on the ground? But in the broader context of what is the purpose of the U.S. government so carefully monitoring the transmissions between all of these nations? So does it work as a projection or an imaginary of American power in the Cold War? Yeah, right? It captures it perfectly. Does it work as a policy system? You know, policy is about so much more, including those values that we talked about before. And so in that sense, no, I mean, it's an utter failure. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think there's a sort of duality that you write about in the paper or a contradiction where it seems on the one hand, such an intellectually ambitious and audacious project to think about, you know, total information to encapsulate world system. But on the other hand, it seems so utterly mundane and bereft of any actual vision because it's just the system as such, right? It is, it takes the status quo as the desired equilibrium. Joy tells us that the project faces big resistance in government. The analysts thought that it undermined their practical wisdom and their human agency. For them, global affairs was more art than science. This really pissed off the Ewams people. They claim, quote, government analysts have an almost theological aversion to quantifying. But in the 1980s, things changed a little because a student of McClelland joined the Reagan administration. And this brings Ewams into the White House. That's after the break. This series has taken an enormous amount of work from a large group of people. Usually I plug them in the credits, but I want to give them a shout out now. Tanner Murleys, Imra Zeman, Jay Coburn, Mark Apollonio, Ren Banger, Ian Souden, Dakota Coop, and more. They are what brought this series together. We've worked really hard for you. And so I do have a favor to ask you. Support our show. The best way you can do that is just help us reach more people. Tell a friend, follow us on social, share our work. We're at Darts and Letters, and we're basically on every platform, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And if you really, really like us, consider becoming one of our beloved patrons. That's at patreon.com forward slash Darts and Letters. We are speaking with Joy Rohde about a 1960s project called EWAMS, the Crisis Early Warning and Monitoring System. This was a computer system built on cybernetic principles. The political scientist Charles McClelland believed it could predict conflicts before it happened. If it worked, this could mean a new age of peace and stability. By the 1980s, the system was ready for prime time. In the early 1980s, one of McClellan's students becomes a, an advisor to the Reagan national security team. And he gets the system put in the White House, in the National Security Council Situation Room. And he presumably tries to bring the results to the attention of the president. It's really hard to know in each of these cases what happened because by the point that it's being used, it's classified, it's behind the scenes. And I've tried to file FOIAs, for example, to see if these things made it into the president's daily brief and nothing has ever uh, been security cleared for me. So it's kind of a mystery. What came of it? So you said that you know Richard Beale brings it into the Reagan administration. We're not quite sure how much it's used. What, what happens in the story after that? So... Beal, unfortunately, dies of an event that the system could never have predicted. He has a conge he has congenital heart failure. And once he dies, the published record goes silent. I don't know what happens. Sometimes that means that systems are being used uh, regularly. I think that's not the case here. I think it just falls into disuse. However, you know, you yourself mentioned co coding tweets and such, right? There, uh, there is a renewed excitement about the possibility of computational approaches to politics that come along with the expansion of social media, with big data, and the vision of EWAMS gets picked up again by DARPA in the mid-2000s. 
And DARPA supports a series of contracts designed to kind of rebuild EWAMs, but with a new name and a broader set of data sources. They call it the Integrated Crisis Early Warning System, or ISUs, and it uses McClellan's data set, which we can trace because um, it's now that data set is continually updated and it's open source and scholars can download it and use it for their own source, for their own purposes. Um, but DARPA teams with Lockheed Martin, the defense contractor Lockheed Martin, and they expand the number of sources that they can use for the system, which they call a global social radar. And it mines social media like Twitter, it mines blogs, it mines, you know, whereas McClelland was using one, two, and at most three news sources for his data set, it uses over 60,000. It can use natural language processing to code things. Um, it uses sentiment analysis and other techniques to do the same thing, to try to forecast what they call major instability events. At the point where the system moves from R&D, where it's kind of public, into use, where it's not public, Lockheed Martin claimed that the system had something like 80% accuracy predicting um, crises and instability. That system is now, at the last point I was able to track it, being used in the U.S. military command in Latin America and potentially elsewhere. It's impossible for us to know how it's being used if those accuracy claims are, in fact, reliable because the um, algorithms are proprietary. Mm. Why do you think it continues to resurface? Why is Lockheed Martin doing the same thing today? That is the question that gets me out of bed and in front of the computer every day, <laughs> right? Why do we continually chase technical solutions to fundamentally political problems? But that's one question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is sort of related more specifically to the national security space. Why do we imagine that security means sort of total control, total information in the United States? And why do we imagine ourselves as continually both immensely powerful and immensely vulnerable? For the first question, which is the one that I feel more adept at, at least thinking through. In the United States, we have had a, this long-standing quest to make political problems, technical problems, the jurisdiction of experts. And the reason, I mean, the basic reason is that there is this fundamental tension between expertise and democracy. We are enticed by expertise in policy spaces because expertise is associated with objectivity. And that mantle of scientific objectivity allows decision makers to claim that they're not letting their own values, their own biases shape their policy decisions. That's really important in a democracy, right? You don't wanna think that your leaders are making decisions on the basis of their own personal interest, et cetera. And so the social sciences come to appear as this value-free policy tool. What do you think is the biggest takeaway for you? I mean, the series being about technocracy and its limitations. What, what does the, the EWAM system teach us about the limitations of technocracy? I think that for me, the lesson about technocracy from EWAMs is that these visions are so seductive and unpacking them, not just to to attack the notion of technocracy, but to see how it reproduces itself in many different locations and how so many different actors are enrolled in it is one of the ways that we can start to trouble how it functions in our own everyday lives where we don't recognize it, right? Because of course, you know, the actors in my story were deeply uncertain. They're deeply afraid of atomic war. Right. They're deeply concerned about their own limitations and the limitations of their state. And that insecurity and that fear, which, you know, we've lived a version of insecurity and fear. We're, you know, we still live versions of insecurity and fear. I think it helps us see in our own intellectual projects and in our own sort of personal political projects where we should guard ourselves mm. against those forms of seduction. I think that also looking carefully at these projects and remembering that no one calls themselves a technocrat. It's not a nice, it's, it's not a nice word. It's not a word that anyone 
you know, you might call your enemy a technocrat, but to recognize, I think, how persistent it is, that desire, that desire for certainty, grounded in expertise, still is for us. That was Professor Joy Rohde. The story we've been talking about is from Rohde's article, Pax Technologica, Computers, International Affairs, and Human Reason in the Cold War. It ends by arguing that McClellan is a precursor to today's big data technocrats, and she captures these ideas very well. I quote, Big data governance rests on a techno-utopian vision in which public policy is a techno-science, rather than an activity informed significantly by expertise, judgment, and moral reasoning. If you want to learn more about Lockheed Martin's technoscience, follow us on Twitter at Darts and Letters. We will tweet photos of their worldwide integrated crisis early warning system. The photos are wild. Socialism and technocracy have always been closely related. Remember, in part one, I said Howard Scott and those early technocrats were quite close with the international workers of the world, and many of them went on to join Upton Sinclair's Socialist Party. Marxism is meant to be scientific. Engels used the term scientific socialism to describe it. So in the Soviet Union, naturally, they were trying to build a kind of technocracy. Adam Curtis's excellent documentary Pandora's Box recounts their vision in great detail. The aim of the Bolsheviks was to transform the people they ruled into what they called scientific beings, people able to understand and control the machines of the modern world rather than become enslaved by them. They organized mass parades where the machines symbolically crushed the irrational dogmas of the past. Moscow became what Lenin called a talking city. Its walls adorned with geometric perspectives, giving glimpses of a new rational world. Its statues surrounded by parallelograms and futuristic structures. Even music was used to transform the way people understood the world. Electrical machines made what was called rational music. Soviet planners were social engineers especially at their Central Institute of Labor. They were trying to train workers to act like machines. It was run by Alexei Gastev, who photographed and studied workers as though they were parts in a machine. It was far more than mere time and motion. Gastev believed he could teach people to think and behave in a rational way. Suffice to say, I have no time for this kind of technocracy, even if it calls itself socialist. As we discussed with Noam Chomsky and the anarchist critique of the Marxist intellectual vanguard, these ideas can easily become despotic. But what if they didn't have to? What if you could create a techno-socialism that was a little less rigid? What if you could have a scientific theory of government that also encouraged worker participation? That's what Salvador Allende hoped to do in Chile. He came to power in 1970, and he quickly nationalized a number of key industries. The challenge for Chilean socialism was, how do we rationally plan these industries, but how do we do so in a way that maintains the freedom of the workers? To them, this looked like it might be a cybernetic problem, so they turned to an unusual figure, Stafford Beer. He promised Chile that you could design freedom. Designing freedom. In 1973, CBC Ideas broadcast Stafford Beer's Massey Lecture. In his third talk this evening, Stafford Beer applies the ideas of his first two lectures to the state, drawing for us a concept of state machinery that is both efficient and a guarantee of freedom. The talk tonight is called A Liberty Machine in Prototype. Stafford Beer. The vision I'm trying to create for you is of an economy that works like our own bodies. There are nerves extending from the governmental brain throughout the country, accepting information continuously. So this is what is called a real-time control system. 
Deer was a rich man, an international business consultant. He drove a Rolls Royce. This made him a rather strange ally to a socialist government. But there was something in his ideas that really appealed. At least it appealed to Fernando Flores. He is an engineer, and he reads broadly, and he thinks about technology and, you know, some of the problems that he's dealing with as an engineer, not only from a technical perspective, but also from a philosophical perspective. This is Eden Medina. She's an associate professor of science, technology, and society at MIT. And she wrote the book on this. It's called Cybernetic Revolutionaries, Technology and Politics in Allende's Chile. It's about how the two men worked together to build something they called Project Cybersyn. It would be a computer system that would connect Chilean factories with Chilean state planners. It really started with Fernando Flores. And what he told me when I interviewed him is that, you know, if you're thinking about changing the economy in this fundamental way, we have the theory, but we don't know how to do it in practice. And it just so happened that he had read Stafford Beer's books on cybernetic management, and he thought that Stafford Beer and his management cybernetic thinking could be a way to bring together philosophy and theory and practice. And so he reached out to Stafford Beer, who was an international business consultant at the time residing in London, and invites Beer to send one of his consultants to Chile to help the government think about the nationalization process and integrate management cybernetic ideas. And Beer is just so excited to read this invitation because he had, at the same time, had been trying to theorize how cybernetics might be applied to politics, how it might be applied to democracy or creating new kinds of democratic systems and and technologies to go along with it. And so for him, it was just an incredible opportunity that had landed at his doorstep And he decides, I'm not sending someone else. I'm going to go myself. And so in November of 1971, he arrives in Chile for the first time. And with Flores, they form a team and they get this project off the ground. I'm curious about the first interaction between Beers and Allende, which figures as a kind of interesting scene in in your book. I mean, what's that meeting like and what does either side ask of each other? Mm -hmm. So one of the the most famous moments in the history of Project Cybersyn is this moment when Stafford Beer meets Chilean President Salvador Allende. And for Beer, this is a very important moment because he wants to convince the president that this project is, is worth supporting. And so, you know, he goes in with a translator and he starts to describe one of his key models, which is called the viable system model. And for beer, it's a model that can be applied to a firm, it can be applied to an economy, it can be applied to a biological organism, it can be applied to the human nervous system. And so beer, because he knows Allende is a medical doctor by training, he decides to go the biological route. And so he starts explaining the viable system model, which has a number of distinguishing features. Among them, you know, it is a balance between top-down control and, you know, freedom and autonomy at the lower levels. And it maintains that balance. And so as he is explaining, you know, this biological version, he points to the brain, which is sitting at the top of the system. And he shows Allende and he says, you know, this is where you are, compañero presidente. And Allende's response is, ah, at last, el pueblo, right? The people. On one hand, it's a very ideological observation, right? About, you know, the people are the ones who are, who are commanding the government. But it's also very cybernetic because it is this balance of the highest system regulating and trying to keep the system stable, but at the same time, preserving liberty, you know, of the people who are part of the system. And so for, for Beer, this was this incredible moment that, that really uh, resonated with him. And it was, yes, the president gets this. And also that there is this alignment between what he was trying to do and with Chile's political project. And so what are the basic goals that they set for themselves? More on the political side, I mean, what is the project trying to instill or trying to accomplish? At a political level, the government is trying to nationalize the most important industries in the country. And they are also trying to redistribute wealth 
They're trying to make goods that had not been accessible to members of poor and working classes. They're going to be accessible to these Chileans for the first time. So this can create a number of problems. The first problem that it could create is that the government doesn't have experience running an economy. So economic management is a big challenge. The second challenge is if people have more money to spend, that creates a risk of inflation. So how do you redistribute wealth and give people you know, more money in their pocket to spend and keep inflation low? And there was a belief that, that you could do it. You actually could keep inflation low if you were able to increase production. So within the government, this was known as winning the battle of production. The Allende government had to win the battle of production. And this is also an issue of economic management. If your factory is shut down because it doesn't have raw materials, because your workers haven't shown up for work, because it doesn't have energy, right, then you are not going to win the battle of production. And so the idea is if we can build a socio-technical system that could help us manage the economy, then it would help us politically as well as economically. One of the things I think is so interesting about this vision is how it differs from totalizing Soviet dreams of cybernetics and the insistence that Allende and Beers has on this also encouraging a kind of worker self-management and autonomy to a certain extent that would resist bureaucratic sort of top-down control. How did they strive to do that in the system? That tension was built into uh, Beer's cybernetic model. So it was one of the central things that, that he was wrestling with. And this idea of trying to figure out how do you maximize the balance of individual liberty while not letting people stray so far that the whole system cannot survive. Right. So in many ways, it can be viewed as an optimization question. Right. It can be viewed as a balancing question. So imagine you are on the factory floor and you notice that all of a sudden you don't have enough raw materials to keep production going. Using Cybersyn, this technology that Stafford Beer helped build, these numbers would be sent to the government. So the government would know, wait a minute, there's a shortage of, of raw materials, but it would give the manager on the factory floor a window of time to resolve the issue themselves. And only after a particular window had passed would the government intervene from above. And Beer looked at that moment, that window of time, as a way of designing freedom. And then the second piece is, how do we incorporate worker knowledge so that it's not only experts that are coming in and saying, this is how your factory should operate, but actually it's recognizing that the workers themselves have a lot of knowledge that they indeed are the experts about production on the shop floor. And so mechanisms also need to be designed to incorporate that knowledge and give mechanisms for workers to actually participate in management so that management can be shared in the future. So onto the sort of particulars of, of the system, I mean, starting from the factory floor, I mean, it's built on a cybernet of telex machines, which in and of itself is kind of interesting because this is a very complex computer network with one computer, right? Yes, that was one of the things that, that stood out to me from the outset. The system is being built at a moment when ARPANET, which is the predecessor to the internet, is in its infancy. So computer networking is in its infancy. And it's also something that is, you know, cutting edge, the height of sophistication. And Chile is thinking about having a networked computer system or a networked communication system that uses a computer, to be more precise, using an older technology, which are telex machines, which are akin to... I don't know, a cross between a typewriter and a chat program, so an older technology, and that they were building this national network using only one computer, which is, you know, some pretty creative engineering going on. So the telex machines kind of route into an ops room, which is so striking. I will you know, certainly post photos of it. People should check out the cover of your book and, and the pictures inside of it. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the ops room. If you could describe a little bit about what you would see if you walked in there and what those things represent. So if you were to walk into the Cybersyn operations room, which was the control center for the project, you might think 
that perhaps you were walking onto the set of Star Trek, you would walk into this hexagonal space that in the spirit of the 1970s had wood paneling and, you know, a color scheme of orange and cream. You would see a series of seven chairs that were positioned in an inward facing circle. There were seven chairs because it's an odd number, so that would facilitate voting. And the chairs were arranged in a circle so that there wasn't a head of a table, so no one was, you know, placed above anyone else. And there was no table because the designers felt that if you brought in a table, it would encourage people to bring in papers. And if you brought in papers, that would encourage people to not listen to each other because they would be shuffling the papers. There were a series of screens positioned around the the operations room located on the walls. One set of screens would display economic data. Uh, images from the factories that had been nationalized, flow charts showing different economic processes. And you could change the images on these screens by pushing a series of buttons on the armrest of the chair. So different combinations of buttons would cause the images to change. And at least for me, one of the more striking features of the operations room is that it represented a contradiction between just this highly stylized image of of modernity, but using technologies that were not cutting edge, because this is what the Chilean government could access at this moment. So today we might think of, you know, flat panel displays, or we might think of, you know, the 1970s television screens. But for the operations room, we're talking about an acrylic screen with a slide projector placed behind it and a series of cables running from the base of the chair underneath the floor to the slide projector so that when you push different combinations of buttons, the carousel would advance to your desired position. And so one of the things that I like to imagine is just the noise of the slide carousel, right? We think of, of modernity perhaps as being soundless, but you know there would have been this, this clicking noise of a slide carousel advancing as you were trying to see the images that you wanted to see. I'm curious about how this factors, this image and the project more broadly factors into the public sort of imaginary, like I know it's not a secret room or a secret project necessarily, but to what extent is it sort of sold and made to be noticed? So in 1973, early in 1973, Beer is preparing a speech. He's going to be giving a major lecture uh, in the UK, and he wants to use it as a moment to publicly announce he's been helping the Chilean government create this computer system, this telecommunication system for economic management. And right before he is supposed to give this speech, a different British publication scoops him and runs with an article that, you know, talks about the system that, you know, Beer is working on in Chile and describes it as a secret project. From there, you know, the press kind of goes wild, uh, both in, in the UK and in Chile, describing the project as Mr. Beer's big brother, as a secret project in Chile, you know, as something that, you know, the government is, is keeping hidden, but is, is going to deprive people of their civil liberties. It's going to destroy the economy, you know, you know put your, your Cold War fears onto these uh, news articles as, as you will. And for those who had been involved in the project, the idea that it had been secret was ludicrous. This was a very tiny group of people that were doing something that was a high risk project that perhaps would pan out, but compared to things like the agrarian reform or you know other larger initiatives, it was very small by comparison. So it's not that it was secret as much that it was marginal. What were the critiques of it? I mean, there's kind of the obvious right-wing critique, but I noticed in the book also like left-wing scientists and science for the people had a a high-profile critique of it. So what were the critiques of the project? There was also concern about the idea of running an economy or running a country by computer and what exactly that would mean. And the word that gets bandied around a lot is technocracy. And in this context, both technocracy and the term technocrat is pejorative. So a technocrat is somebody who wants to govern using their technical expertise, who wants to govern using technology. And so if this is going to be a democratic socialist government with worker participation, the concern was, are the engineers coming in 
And are they building systems that could be abusive to the workers? Or are they coming in, you know, and building systems that perhaps would not represent worker interests or would have mechanisms for worker participation? And I think how we view that is actually really tricky because, like, let me, let me lay out a few examples. So from Stafford Beer's perspective, from the outset, he wanted the system to be an example of worker participation. So from his perspective, charges of technocracy were against everything he was trying to do because he viewed his work as creating a people science. He was giving science to the people, power to the people. Now, in practical terms, you know, I've interviewed engineers that were going into the factory floor. They were talking to managers. They were talking to other engineers. They weren't talking to workers. They viewed themselves as those with university educations, as workers not having university educations. And so those conversations perhaps weren't even happening. This is a limitation that Stafford Beer had. So even though, you know, he's coming in with goodwill, even though he has learned a tremendous amount about Chile, even though he has made friends and connections and, and colleagues who are part of different, different pieces of, of Chile's uh, project for political change, he still talks about workers as a monolith, right? He is going to empower workers. Workers are going to be part of decision making. We're going to use the expertise of workers. And workers were not a monolith. People who are working on the shop floor belong to different political parties. Some of them supported the government. Some of them were against the government. Some of them uh, had union positions that had given them power on the shop floor previously. And, you know, they wouldn't want to lose their position, perhaps, to a technical system coming in, right? They, they had, you know, something at stake. Uh, so when we're thinking about this system, you know, you can't think about the category of worker as, as a monolith. It's interesting, in some of the drawings that are in your book, there's one where the worker is right at the center of the system and clearly speaks to the sort of the anti-technocratic impulse. But then you see others where there's like a man at a desk and the arrows are pointing down to a multitude, to a mass. And just the image in general of like seven men around a small room getting signals from every which way and making decisions about the national economy, even if there's a, a small grace period where a worker can decide as well, it seems hard not to see that room as a technocratic room. Mm -hmm. And so in the book, I argue that these two competing visions between the worker at the heart of everything versus the computer at the heart of everything really get at this central tension, right? Between is this technocratic, you know, is this democratic or going to further worker participation, and that we can even see this visually. And I think it gets at the heart of what is a political project in this, in this context. Like, what is it that makes a computer system or a telecommunication system socialist? What is it that makes it this particular interpretation of socialism, right? If the computer system can help further the nationalization process even if he does it with, you know, the, the group of men sitting around the computer system, you know, some people at that time would say, well, then that is, you know, a kind of political project that we want to have, right? That is expertise that is being mobilized in the service of, of Chilean socialism. You know, whereas others would say, no, it's about the practice, right? It's not about the tool. It's about the social interactions and the organizational interactions and the way that, you know, that this kind of work is done that has to put the workers in a more central part. And without that, that component of practice and organization, then it's not a socialist technology, which I think is a really interesting insight, even for how we think about technology today. Dateline 1973, Chile. The world's only freely elected Marxist president is overthrown by military coup. What happened to the project after the military coup? It was destroyed. So on September 11th, 1973, the military launched a coup against the Allende government. The coup resulted in Allende's death, and it ushered in 17 years of military dictatorship. And, you know, the, the military expressed an interest in Project Cybersyn, 
Uh, in particular, as you might imagine, they heard that this was a project for control. And so if you're the military, you're very interested in control. So, you know, some of the project team members told me that they were interviewed and, you know, an interrogator would say, oh, I hear this is a, a project ab about control. Like, tell me about this control project. And, you know, the person had been trained in cybernetics and said, well, what definition of control? Like, how are you thinking of control? Uh, because it was an, an ad adaptive idea of control, right? Not a domination idea of control. And eventually, you know, the military realized that this was not something that was useful for them. And so work on the project stopped. The operations room was destroyed. That was Eden Medina, author of Cybernetic Revolutionaries, Technology and Politics in Allende's Chile. Stafford Beer arrived in Chile a businessman, but he left a hippie. He grew a long wizard beard and became a yoga instructor later in life. His writing became more political, but it never lost a certain technocratic flavor. His last book proposes a geometric theory of dispute resolution. Apparently, the polygon can help us bring peace to the Middle East. Fernando Flores also never lost a certain technocratic flavor but he went in a very different political direction. He became a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Eden writes that Flores wholly remade himself in the image of neoliberalism. Which takes us to the final part of our series. Next week on Technocracy Now!, we look at right-wing technocracies. These are not all utopian dreams. Some of these technocratic systems actually exist, like in the Amazon warehouse with its algorithmically managed workers. Technology is the organizing force, meaning that especially software systems capture and remember the position of items on the shelves and then guide workers when it comes to retrieving a certain item and then shipping it. Plus, the neo-reactionaries, they want to take this vision and implement it much more widely. What if our entire country was run by Silicon Valley technocrats? You know, startups are run as dictatorships, not as democracies, because democracies are an inefficient way of making decisions together and effectuating some kind of goal. That's next week on Darts and Letters. And that's it for this week's episode of Darts and Letters. Darts and Letters is a proud member of the Harbinger Media Network, Canada's largest network of left-wing podcasts. We're also now syndicated on the New Books Network. Our program is produced by Jay Coburn, Mark Apollonio, and Ren Bangert. Our marketing assistant is Ian Souten. As always, our theme song and outro is composed by Mike Barber. Graphic designs are by Dakota Coop, and I'm your host and editor, Gordon Caddick. This episode was part of a wider series that looks at the politics of technology and techno-utopian thinking. It received funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The scholarly leads on this project are Professors Tanner Murleys at Ontario Tech University and Imra Zeman at the University of Toronto Scarborough. They both provided research and editorial guidance to this episode. We are also backed by our generous patrons. Join us and join them by going to patreon.com forward slash darts and letters. Thanks for listening. Check back in next week. Mm -hmm.